get into Galatians. We left off in chapter 10. Or chapter 10. Verse 10, chapter 1. There is not 10 chapters of this book. That's why I picked it. No, I'm just kidding. And um, the first 10 verses of Galatians, uh, Paul is uh, writing a letter to the churches in Galatia. And he, this letter is kind of a little bit scathing. He's a little bit uh, upset with the churches of Galatia because as soon as he left, the Judaizers came in. And they started preaching a different gospel, and the church of Galatia ate it up. So the Judaizers were saying that they had to add the law to the gospel. So when Paul found out about it, he was pretty fired up. And Paul says to him in verse 6, he says, I marvel that you turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's the Judaizers. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached, let him be accursed. He said, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So Paul's pretty, he's pretty fired up. Usually when he starts out, he's sending a letter somewhere. He's, he's real cordial. And, and in this letter, you know, he starts out, grace to you and peace from God, the Father. Then he, then he hammers him. He's like, what are you doing? So he was pretty fired up. And um, he explained to them that what he had preached to them and taught to them came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. It didn't come from some other man. That gospel came from Christ. So he was getting after him. And then he starts discussing kind of his credentials a little bit. He talks in verse 15. Verse 15. We haven't got there yet. Verse 10. We stopped there. So he says, For do I not persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Which is a pretty strong statement that we, we should consider for ourselves, obviously. If we're here to please somebody, please men, who are we? Are we servants of God? Are we, are we bond servants of Jesus Christ? Are we followers of Jesus Christ? You know, because if, if we come in, everything we do is to get accolades now. Number one, you get your praise here, you ain't getting in heaven. You know? Like the Pharisees used to like to do everything in public. You know? They got their, they got their reward right there. So... You know, we look back at the first 10 verses of Galatians and we see that they fell away from the gospel, right? Because they added to it. You know, we may look at it and say, man, what are you thinking? Why'd you fall away and put the chains of bondage of the law back on yourself? Why would you do that? But the thing is, we have the entire Bible. We do, right? And we have the commands of Christ. What have we done with those? How are we different today than the Galatians were then? Because there's all kinds of scriptures that, you know, we all we all go by a scripture. We go, yeah, I know you're talking to me, but I have a hard time with this. You know, I know this is what I'm supposed to do, but we always add that but in there. <sighs> I don't know if I can do that. Well, and then, and then, then another thing that that people will do is a wrongly interpret a verse because they don't want to have to be accountable to that. And that happens all over, all the time. I'm guilty. I've done it before. And then God brings it out and goes, "No, this is what I'm saying. This is what you're supposed to do. It's how you're supposed to act." So, when in Romans when we were talking 
we were teaching in Romans, we're talking about how we had to die to our flesh. Well, that's what that is. You know, we see something that we kind of want to walk by real slow and hope it doesn't look at us, you know, real strong. You know, that's where we need to die to flesh. You go, you know what, you're right. I have to accept this. I have to deal with this. This is who you want me to be. I can't be who I want me to be, right? So when we look at we look at some of these letters and we see where where apostles are getting after people or Paul Paul specifically getting after people for things, and we look at that, and we go, man, what's wrong with those guys? We're the same way. We're not we're not any different. We all have to have that battle. We all have to we all have to uh, guard our hearts. In our minds, through Christ Jesus, right? That's what the Scripture tells us. So, as we grow and submit more to the Word of God, submit more to God's commands, the commands of Christ, we begin to we begin to exemplify Christ. People see Christ in us. That's the goal. That's what God's looking. That's what Jesus is looking for. He wants to see Himself in us. That's what everybody out here wants to see. Because everybody out here on the streets have seen all kinds of Christians that have run around with all kinds of rules as long as your leg, right? But they don't live them, right? If they see Jesus, they're going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. I've seen an interview with a guy that was a, that was a, he was a Satanist. And someone just loved him, regardless. Just knew that he was, but just loved him anyway. And it really affected his life. Um, and he's like, I could see Jesus in them. Well, that's what we're supposed to see in us. That's how we're supposed to be. So as we, as, as we all go by those scriptures that we really don't want to look at real deep, we need to stop and dig. Dig into them. Study it. Dig to the deepest part of the, that you can dig to. Go as far as you can with it. And know the truth because that's how we're, that's what we're accountable for. That's what I'm accountable for. You guys are accountable for. And as I was thinking about this, and these things were popping up in my head, I was like, "Man, I'm crushing my own feet here." And I was thinking, if Paul, I'm not saying Paul, but we'll just think about it. we'll just we'll just make this crazy assumption. What if Paul founded this church? What letter would he write to us? You know, what if you founded the churches in the United States? What letters would he be writing? But specifically to me, what would he write to me personally? You know, because that's just a question that popped in my head, you know, and and uh, I know we're under grace, right? So were they. So there's no excuse for what they did. So I'm under grace. <laughs> I don't care. He's still accountable, right? Obviously, Paul was, he was tearing them guys up. So obviously, uh, they were. But and Christ didn't give us these scriptures thinking that we could not live up to the commands that he has set forth for us. And, and the the key element of doing that is who he sent when he left the Holy Spirit right a lot of times people don't have that relationship or have a relationship with the Holy Spirit depending on what their upbringing was because the church that I grew up in man you didn't talk about the Holy Spirit too awful much because they think you were charismatic and they you're like hey easy you know <laughs> he's there he's a comforter but hey don't you know it was, um, it was like, like the Trinity was, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't quite get it. So, but the more that, that we, the closer we get to Christ, the more we get into the word, the more that we cleanse ourselves with the, with the word, right? That's what the Bible tells us to do. The easier we'll be able to deal with these things that are tough. They're tough. And only by submitting to the Holy Spirit and overcoming our flesh, will we be able to do that? Because personally, I'm, I'm tired of fighting the same battles, you know? And the thing is, it's because I'm stubborn, you know? Just like you, Dev, I'm stubborn. 
I hope so. I hope this is recorded. What's your last name, social security number? Anyway. So, but we go through these same trials and tribulations because we didn't, we didn't stop and, and submit and let go, you know? So at least I know that's where, where I'm coming from and I'm sure I'm not any different than anybody else. So I don't have an excuse. I have no excuse. And I have no one to blame but myself. And I think we're all in that, in that same boat. So as we move on through this, through this book, let's kind of just kind of keep that, that in mind. And uh, we'll read from, uh, we'll read some out of uh, the rest of chapter one and into chapter two. So starting with verse 11, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have learned of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly jealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, when it pleased him to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Sicia, or Silica, and I was known by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Going back to verse 11 and 12, Paul, Paul's going to, through this, he's going to present six arguments, arguments in defense of his message, the defense of the gospel and his ministry. First of all, the gospel was received by divine revelation. We see that in verse, verse 12. It was according to man. Man did not originate it. And Paul makes everything of God and nothing of man because he says he didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught, taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed it to him himself. Secondly, Paul's failure to include Judas. Let me make sure I didn't turn too many pages here. I like to have notes, otherwise I get lost. There we go. Secondly, Paul's failure to include Jewish law in the gospel. That wasn't from his lack of, of knowledge of Judaism, obviously. I mean, he tells you right here who he was, his former conduct in Judaism. He was the cream of the crop. He was in, he was in the top few percent. <laughs> yeah, very few percent. Of, of his class. He was, he was sharp. So his, by his birth and training, he was steeped in the law. And as we know, he was a notorious persecutor of the church. You know, he was, we've, we've read that in earlier, in other books, earlier books. And in his zeal for the traditions of his father, he surpassed many of the other students of the law. He knew the law. So the gospel of salvation by faith, apart from the law that he preach, preached, wasn't because he was ignorant of the law. So why did he omit, omit it from the gospel? Because the gospel that he preached was given to him by God. He didn't add to it. And thirdly, in verse 15, starting with verse 15, 15. The first few years of ministry, he did, he did that completely independent of any other apostles or anyone else. After his conversion, he didn't immediately get with the apostles, other leaders, 
And he didn't go to Jerusalem where the apostles were. Instead, he went to Arabia, then returned to Damascus. The reason he avoided Jerusalem wasn't out of disrespect for the other apostles. It was because he was commissioned by Jesus to go to the Gentiles. They're not in Jerusalem. So he didn't go there. He didn't need any blessing or direction of man. He was independent of that. And in verse 15, he says, God separated him from his mother's womb. Paul realized that before his birth, he was set apart by God for a unique ministry. He adds, God called me through his grace, talking about his conversion on the road to Damascus. Verse 16, he shows that God intended to reveal his son, Jesus, in him. This gives us some insight into God's purpose in calling us to reveal his son in us. That's God's purpose, to reveal Jesus in us. So we would represent the Lord Jesus to the world. He reveals Christ in our hearts in verse 16 in order that he may display Christ through us verses 16 through 23 in order for God to be glorified when people see Christ in us they have to make a decision because the reality of Jesus is in their face because we're not the same we're different we're not like everyone else not that we're holier than thou because that's not how Jesus was it's that it's that Humility with power. That strength and humility. You're not going to deny what comes out of this individual's mouth because you see, you just see the truth. So having that testimony, having that, having that, that, um, spirit in you and working through you they have to make a decision do I accept what I see as truth or do I reject it and walk away when people see because there's a hurting world a dying and hurting world we know that and when you see hope when you see truth when you see something that's absolute something that you know is, is, is good and right you're going to gravitate to that And that glorifies God because God's like, we know that we can, that's not going to happen in and through us. We know that's not going to, we know that only because of the Holy Spirit, we, we can actually have any opportunity for anybody to see any good in our lives. So who gets the glory? Not us. God gets all that glory. It belongs to him anyway. So fourthly, in verses 18 through 20, when Paul finally visits Jerusalem he only met with Peter and James apart from that he was relatively unknown in the churches of Judea and Paul didn't visit Jerusalem as we know until three years after his conversion he went there to meet Peter it was it was a personal visit not an official visit while he was there he met James the brother of Jesus and he stayed with Peter for 15 days 21 through 24. After that, he spent much of his time in Syria and Cilicia, so much that the churches of Judea didn't know him personally. All they knew is that he was one of the, the one that treated Christians cruelly and now is a Christian and preaching Christ. His testimony preceded him, and they glorified God for what he had done in Paul's life because they knew who Paul was because they are probably hiding from him. They probably knew what he looked like because they were probably hiding from him, right? But to hear his testimony and think about that. Somebody that doesn't really know you hears your testimony and it affects their life. Other Christians are just, it builds them up. It edifies them knowing what Christ did in your life. We've all met people like that. People that we knew were just gone astray. It was like, man, you know, they have hope. Christ can do something in their life, right? But you look and you're like, wow. Well, hey, I was that guy. You guys were that person, every one of you. 
Because when we're not in Christ, we're not saved, we're his enemy. Nobody is way away. We're all the same distance. You know, we're enemies of Christ. And to see the miracle of salvation and the changed life and the changed heart, especially people we really know, really close to, is such a blessing. It just, it fires you up. So let's read on. Chapter 2. I'm going to try to get through chapter 2. I don't know if I can get through it. I'm kind of going a little quick. But um, we'll see how far we get. We'll see who starts snoring first. No, it's throughout 2 as well. So, chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. And I also took Titus with me. And I went up to Jerusalem. I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the, t the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of, reputa of reputation. So he didn't, he didn't go and just tell everybody. He, just, he went to the leaders and told them what he was doing, what he was preaching. So lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be of something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he worked effectively with Peter for the apostleship to the, to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Fifthly, here's the fifth one. During Paul's later visit to Jerusalem, the apostles, the apostles agreed that Paul's gospel was divine. Verses 1 through 10. Whether this was 14 years after his conversion or after his first trip, we don't know. We know that he received a revelation from Christ to go together with Barnabas, his co-worker, and Titus, the Gentile. He was converted through Paul's ministry. The Judaizer had insisted that Titus be circumcised for full salvation. Paul opposed this because he realized that the truth of the gospel was at stake. It's not the gospel plus circumcision. It's not the gospel plus law. It's the gospel, period. So when Paul reached Jerusalem, he communicated to them that the gospel which he preached among the Gentiles, he communicated to them the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles. But he did it privately to those who were of reputation, so those that were, of le that were the leaders there. By any means, he might run or had run in vain. Why did Paul speak privately to the spiritual leaders and not to the whole assembly? He didn't need their approval. He didn't need the approval of the leaders. God already told him what to do, and he obeyed and went. If he needed their approval, he wouldn't have spent three years out here preaching a gospel that needed to be approved by these guys, right? So he didn't need that. But it was a matter of common courtesy to speak to the leaders first. If they had any questions as to his gospel, Paul wanted to answer them right away. Then he could go before the church with the full support of the other gospel, other apostles, so that nobody would have any, anything to say because they were in agreement. The whole question of legalism was brought to a head in the case of Titus. Would the Jerusalem churches receive this Gentile convert to fellowship, or would they insist that he first be circumcised? So after much discussion and debate, the apostles decided that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. That's basically what that was saying. 
The underlying reason why Paul was led to go to Jerusalem was made clear by linking the beginning of verse 2 with the beginning of, of verse 4. So the beginning of verse 2 is, and I went up by revelation and communicated with them. The beginning of verse 4 is, and this occurred because of the false brethren secretly brought in who came by stealth to spy on us and bring us into bondage. Uh, hold on, I didn't read enough of the first two. Went up to Revelation, communicated with them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He went up by Revelation, and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in. Some Jewish teachers from Jerusalem were posing as Christians and had somehow been secretly brought into the church at Antioch and were teaching that circumcision was essential for salvation. And Paul and Barnabas, they opposed, the vigor, opposed them vigorously. And to settle the matter, Paul and Barnabas and others went to Jerusalem to get the opinions of the apostles and elders. And the leaders added nothing to what Paul was preaching. They had been preaching the same gospel. And then we look there and it says, God does not accept, or wait a minute, God does not accept man-made distinctions that we place on people. He doesn't even give superior authority to those in Jerusalem. God shows no favoritism. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. Because a lot of times we see these, these preachers, we see these people that we look up to, and we're like, wow, man, their faith is right way up here. And I feel like mine's way down here. Well, God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't show favoritism. He, they're not better Christians. They're just... And it may be in a different spot in their salvation. That doesn't make them a superior authority. I mean, they may know more about the gospel, but it doesn't matter. You still need to go back and check. You still need to be a Berean. You still need to study and make sure that what you hear is the truth. Because you're responsible for your salvation. The Bible tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, we're responsible for what we hear and believe. So, no matter how much we respect an individual or how much, how, how knowledgeable we think they are of the gospel, of the, of the scriptures, we're without excuse. We need to know what, why we know what, what we know. We have to study. We need to get in the word. We need to figure it out. Because the only pe person that God's going to question is us. And to stand before God and go, you know, I went through all these things. I did all these things for you. And he goes, I don't know who you are. That's a scary verse. That's probably the scariest verse in the Bible. If you ask me, I never knew you. Depart from me. Well, hold on. I did all these things in your name. I don't know you. That's stuck with me for a long time going, and I've had many, many conversations with God going, Lord, I don't want to hear that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't want you to say that to me, you know, because it should put a fear of God in us. Not that, we're, not that we're scared to death to see God, but we should fear that we're not in right relationship. We should fear that, does he know me? Well, we can be secure in the fact that he does because we see fruit in our lives. We don't walk around going, oh, I don't know if I'm saved. Know that you're saved. But at the same time, when we read those scriptures, it keeps us humbled. You know, because we're like, man, I, I, don't, want that to, I don't want that to happen. But we need to be confident in our salvation. You know, we shouldn't run around being, being afraid that we're, not, or that we're not saved. I'm not trying to say that. But we definitely need to keep focused, definitely need to keep moving forward in our faith, moving forward in our working on our salvation. Working on our salvation with fear and trembling means to me, I need to stay at this. I need, I need to work this out. I need to be, I, I want to know that what I believe is right. I want truth. You know, it's like watching TV. I can't even watch news. I haven't watched news for I can't tell you how many years now. Because it used to be you'd sit down around the television, and Walter Cronkite would come on, and you'd sit there. Everything that come out of that guy's mouth, you're like, yeah, he's telling us the truth. <laughs> he probably was lying to us. We don't know. 
but it seemed everything was the truth. You ask, our, if we could ask our grandparents, all of us are probably don't have any around anymore. If we could say, did you believe the news when you were growing up? Sorry, everybody. I know it's like old crowd here. Did you believe the news anchor? And they're going to tell you, yeah. When I was a kid, I did growing up. I mean, it was the news. It was supposed to be true. Right? Well, it's the same thing now. There's so many people out there weaseling their way into, into the church or having some kind of ministry that, that you're going to be exposed to that are just like these Judaizers. They're peddling lies. They're adding to the gospel. Revelations, I think there's a, there's a curse for that. To anyone that adds to that book or takes away from this book. And I just want to know the truth, and I know you guys do too. So together, you know, iron sharpens iron. Iron can't sharpen iron if one of the one of the one of the blades are so dull that you can't get nothing to move. You know, you you got to be in the word. You got to be studying this because the most fun that that I have is going back and forth through the word with people. You say, hey, what do you think of this? Not that we're debating, we're just trying to find the truth. Well, this is what I think. What do you think? Oh, this is what I think this says. I do this with my dad a lot. And it's a lot, it's fun because I learn so much. I learned so much about my dad, right? And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. He's like, what do you mean? You know, we'll go back and forth. It's fun. And it's 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 funny because it's it's pretty exciting actually you know the holy spirit just gets you fired up because you're going back and forth and you're just digging and, and that's what it's for that's what that's what we're supposed to do and it's really a great time because we all have different ideas of different things and we have reasons for that but if we get in the word and we study and we dig we can find out the truth together you know because i'm sure there's a lot of things that well, there's a lot of things that I grew up believing I don't believe now. I think we've all done that. I think that's that's just part of our our journey with Christ. Is as we go move along, He reveals more truth, and we see where we were fed some some garbage, right? Oh, you're right, brother. Along the way, so it's exciting to do that. So, in verses 7 and 8, the apostles saw that Paul had been commissioned to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Just as Peter had been sent to the Jews, both preached the same gospel, just to different nationalities. In 9 and 10, even James and Cephas, Peter and John, pillars of the church, perceived that God was working through Paul and gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And then the only suggestion that they made was that Paul and Barnabas remember the poor, the very thing that Paul said he was eager to do. Paul says right there in verse, verse 10, he said, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Paul had a heart for the poor. And that's a good example to us, you know, and I'm, it's to me, it's, it's really cool to see, to see the food ministry here. You know, we've all been in situations where we were in need. You know, we've, we've all grown up through that. I don't think any of us were born with a silver spoon in our mouth. You know, we had to work hard every day, <laughs> you know, just to make it. You know, and I, I grew up and I didn't know that we were... We, did, we were lower, lower middle class. We weren't dirt poor, but there was times where we didn't have anything. You know, there was a time in my life where my dad, he prayed, and us kids, when, we heard, when dad prayed, we all listened. Dad prayed that God would send money so we could make our house payment because he was laid off. It was like, I don't know, 500 bucks or something we needed for our bills, our, all our bills, 500 bucks. It doesn't seem like much, but then it was a lot. My dad goes out to the mailbox. This is some things in faith that, that I learned about, about faith as a kid. 
my dad prayed and asked God to do that. He's like, you know, we can't pay our bills. We need $500. He walks out to the mailbox. There's $500 in our mailbox. As a kid, that's huge, right? Because, you know, you're just learning about God. You know, you might have got saved, accepted Christ because you were scared. You didn't want to go to hell because you had that fire and brimstone message that Sunday night. You white knuckled the back of the pew until you couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> I, got, I got home. I, had to, I made it to the house. But it was, I was like, Dad, I, 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 got, I don't know. I, got, I need to get saved. I don't want to go to hell. Well, that's not a reason to get saved. When you get saved because you love Jesus. You know you need him. Not because you're afraid you're going to go to burn. Well, you will if you don't meet him. So that's the bottom line. It was the truth. But anyway, when I seen that, I seen my dad pray, expecting that God was going to answer his prayer. And God immediately answered his prayer. It might have been the next day. I don't remember. Because I don't remember. I don't know the timeline. And to see that that happened. And that was just one of many things that happened in, in my lifetime growing up. Listening to my dad pray and seeing God move on his behalf. So it put something in my heart as a kid. Now, did I always hang on to that? Well, I mean, it's always been in my mind and in my heart, but it was many years of not looking at it or dealing with it. Kind of like what I was saying earlier, sliding by those verses that I didn't want to deal with, you know. <clears throat> But those things are huge. And to see the people come in here, I mean, that could be us at any point in time. And it's, some of us has been us, you know. And um, to see that and just know that God's meeting needs and we get to be a part of it, you know. It's just, a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think God blesses that. We've had many chances to pray with people, you know, and God does what he wants to do afterwards. You know, we love on them. We encourage them. We pray for them because and we, we let them know that, hey, you know what? We're no different. <clears throat> you know, we've been in need. Like Paul says, you know, to be content in whichever state he's in, you know, he's been in need and he's had an abundance. So I can see where Paul's heart for the poor and the needy and the downtrodden is there. So I think we'll close there and we'll, <clears throat> we'll pick up, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, verse 11 um, next week. Anybody have any questions? Any answers? We got to five. Yep. And I think number six comes. I'm not sure yet. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for tonight and, uh, and the chance to get in your word, Lord. And I just, uh, just thank you for the book of Galatians, Lord, as revealing the truth to us. Lord, about how we should be and how we should act and how we should treat your gospel. We just pray that you will just guide us and direct us, Lord, as we work out our salvation, Lord, as, as we draw closer to you, Lord. And just pray that you would, your Holy Spirit would just fill us and just touch our lives in a special way, Lord, that give us clarity, Lord, give us, reveal, keep, continue to reveal truth to us because that's what your word says you'll do. We know you will. And, Lord, just give us the strength to endure to the end because we know that's coming soon. As we look around this, this world, we see that time is short. Lord, there's so many hearts. We're, we're looking forward to you touching, Lord. There's lives, there's family members' lives, Lord, that we just continue to pray that you would just touch and just bring them back to you or bring them to you for the first time. Lord, we just lift them up, whoever they are, as we, as we pray together, Lord. We can all think of someone that's on our heart. Lord, we just pray you will draw them to you, Lord, that we might see your work in their life before you come back. We just thank you. We give you all honor, glory, and praise. 
the precious name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen.